Um, and thanks for coming to the presentation. I know you have a lot of other ones to choose from. So. Yeah. So as you mentioned, uh, my topic today is on embedded and firmware development and how you can apply Agile in that context. Uh, and I'll get into my background and my experience and how I'm applying that into this presentation. So, sorry, I got one technical. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I've, I've done a lot of training over the year, certification manager through .o, um, Dean Leffingwell with SAFE and Ken Schraber and Scrum. And what I, you know, so over the years I've kind of built this huge knowledge base and also my experience, and that's why you know I'm, I'm able to go into client sites and be very pragmatic with my approach, which I'll be talking about. Uh, these are some of the companies I've worked with in the past recently. Uh, and you'll see that there are, like, there are quite a few companies on that list that are embedded in firmware. In specific, uh, SK Hynix, Juniper, Cisco, and Calix. So SK Hynix is a firmware company, and they do chip manufacturing. And then the other three are embedded. Uh, they're in the business of you know, um, building routers and switches, and that kind of thing, for telecom. And today's presentation is going to be based on you know, the experience from those four clients in, in particular. So when I go into a client site like a Cisco a Juniper, uh, you know, they're always quick to say that you know Agile is not going to work, and you know we're not like those other companies like uh, Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn, right? And what's interesting is I actually interviewed at Twitter, you know, a couple months ago, or probably about six months ago, and I went to their San Francisco office, and I was sitting in the, like, they put me in a room, and then one by one they come and start interviewing me. And what I realized that day, that whole day of interviewing at Twitter, is that, you know, they're very big on being startup. You know, like I think you heard yesterday in Mark's presentation about um, Eric Ries and his book on being startup. And then Facebook, you know, I've never done any consulting for Facebook or coaching for Facebook for that matter, uh, but I know that it's Kent Beck, who's one of the uh, pioneers of extreme programming. Uh, he's a full-time consultant there. And you know, with these three companies, like, what you notice is that they're very big on um, continuous delivery, right? Now, let's take a step back and let's think about the embedded space or the firmware space. Do you think that we can do continuous delivery in that space? Like, can we always deploy to a hardware device or a firmware chip? No, no, we can test it out. But yeah, I mean, in time to the market it will be completely different. We just cannot get yeah. it out. As exactly. As and I'll get into some details of how we can do early testing. Uh, but you're right. I mean, you can't just deploy to a chip. Probably the chip is not even made yet. So, yeah. So the whole concept of continuous delivery is out the window, right? I mean, so when I was sitting there interviewing on Twitter, I realized that I'm not the right person for this job because a lot of my experience is not in the lean startup space. It's in the embedded firmware space. So, yeah, so let's, let's take a deeper dive and let's look at some of the reasons why people think Agile is, is, is a big challenge in this space. Um, what about feature design analysis, right? Uh, for those of you who have worked at a Cisco or similar, you're given a feature, you're an engineer, and if someone tells you, okay, go, go break it down into stories so we can start sprinting, well, like, what's your answer going to be? We have to understand, the, first of all, we have to take the feature, uh, see how it is going to be, uh, understand the requirements. Yeah. And, uh, it's it's like not the straightforward, it just cannot do it. Exactly. It requires a lot of planning, thinking. So it's, it's a little bit different than if you're you know, creating a mobile app, right? A mobile app, like, I'm not trying to say that mobile app development is easy, but I think when you compare it to edit development, it probably is easier, and probably if someone gives you a feature for a mobile app, you might be able to probably break it out into a story within a reasonable amount of time within the sprint and, and execute it, right? But here, it's not the case. Um, so you are going to have to do some feature analysis, you know, in order to break down that feature into a set of stories that are consumable in the sprint, whether your sprint is one week, two weeks, or four weeks, right? Then what about the hardware, right? Because your software is coupled to your hardware, right? I mean, how is that going to work? Are you going to build your hardware in a two-week sprint, or an increment of your hardware in a two-week sprint, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's another challenge, right? And then what about testing, right? 
how are you going to test if your hardware is not going to be ready for several months, right? So that's another challenge that we have to take a look at in this presentation. So one thing that I think I like to apply when I go into a client site, as I mentioned early in the second slide, is that I'm very pragmatic with my approach. Uh, I don't go in, you know, saying that we have to do pure Scrum, or we have to do Kanban, or we have to do just like extreme programming, right? Like, so I, I actually pulled this terminology from Jurgen's book. For those of you who are not familiar with Jurgen, he's the person behind Management 3.0, uh, which is becoming a pretty popular course for leadership, right? So he talks about the Mojito method, right? So if you think, if you think about this drink, a Mojito, a lot of things goes into it, right? All these different ingredients goes into it to make this really drinkable, you know, likable drink, right? You know, if you're at a New Year's Eve party and you want to get a mojito, right? So same thing, in Agile, you're going to pull things, and I think Mark covered this yesterday a little bit with, with the dad framework, right? Where you're going to pull different processes, practices that you think is going to work well in your environment put it together in your own customizable framework. And that's exactly the approach that I take when I go into a client site like a Cisco or Juniper, is that I go in with a pragmatic mind that, okay, let's understand you know, what the issues are in your product development process, and let's see what we can do as far as going agile and what can work. So with that said, Jurgen talks about a couple of different aspects when you go in and you try to do a transformation, right? Uh, the first thing is you dance with the system. So there is a current system in place, and you're going to poke that system. You're going to change, tweak things to see what the outcome is, right? So that so he, he refers to that as dancing with the system. Then, of course, mind the people. We all know in Agile, you've got to respect people, right? It's also a lean um, principle as well, it's respect, right? If you go in as a coach, and you say, you know, I'm the coach, I know everything, listen to me, you know, you're going to probably piss off a lot of people. And I can tell you, I, I've seen it happen. So, because you're dealing with VPs, executive management, you know, they, they need to be respected. And at the same time, people at the team level want to be respected because they, they don't want to feel that they're being forced to go from a status quo process to this new process that they don't fully buy into, right? Has anyone read the book Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey Moore? where he talks about um, early adopters and um, uh, early majority, late majority. Yeah. So there's some for yeah. Exactly. So when you go into a, so if you are a coach now or one day you're going to be a coach and you go in, you know, you are going to have people that are going to want to be early adopters. They're your champions. They're the ones that you want to quickly build a relationship with, for sure, because they're going to, the ones that are going to help you to promote the transformation. What is that book you say? Uh, it's called Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey Moore. Yeah. Um, chasm? C-H-A-S-M. Uh, the author is Jeffrey Moore. So for those, I'll give you a side note though. If you ever get Jeffrey Moore to speak at an Agile conference, his speaking fee is $50,000. It's pretty expensive. <laughs> but his book is very popular. And Silicon Valley, by the way, like, I'm based in Silicon Valley. Uh, anyone you talk to in a second of that that has read his book. But yeah, he's a very expensive speaker. Maybe you can ask Socket to try to get him for next time. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so res uh, respecting the people is definitely very critical. You are going to have people that are going to support you early on. It's always been the case with me when I go into a client site. Like, there's always a handful of people that are really excited about going agile. You quickly want to build a relationship with them. You quickly want to, you know, motivate them to, you know, do whatever it takes to, you know, help you, right? Um, so you definitely keep that in mind. Stimulate the network. You're going to have a lot of people that are not going to be motivated, right? And you've got to figure out creative ways to motivate them. You know, and one of the ways I feel to motivate is making them be a part of this journey, right? Not you as a coach coming in and just saying, okay, this is what we're going to do, and you know, because it's an executive order, you're going to have to do it. You don't want that. So you, you want to build these 
practice is on the ground up, right? So you probably heard this morning a little bit about the Agile values, right, the manifesto. So you know, it's four basic values, right? And it breaks down into 12 principles. And as long as the practices that you come up with is in alignment with those values and principles, then you, know, you can fairly say it's Agile, right? Like, like there's nothing saying that you have to do something a certain way. As long as at the end of the day, you evaluate your processes and your practices and it's aligned with, with the values and principles, then you're fine. So yeah, so stimulating the network really you know, boils down to motivation and motivating the people. And the best way I know how to motivate people is making them feel that they're part of the journey. And then change the environment. You know, this one, like I sometimes didn't think was a big deal. I'm like, you know, so what if you don't have open space, you know, when you work versus a cubicle, right? And then I realized, you know, over the years when I started to see clients that did do the environmental change where they took down all the walls, the cubes, and made it very open and transparent. And they even, like I know Cisco has put in a lot of money to actually remodel their buildings. Uh, they have a big plan for all their buildings in, in San Jose. Um, where they're trying to put whiteboards and you know, create a living room kind of atmosphere uh, where you can go and have conversations. It definitely makes a difference. When I was at Twitter that day, you know, Twitter, very interesting, it's completely open space. Um, they made their focus around food, actually. So you go in there, at least this was the floor that I was on at Twitter. They had like a gourmet big um, you know, kitchen cafeteria, all open. And you can just go in, and grab whatever you want. The food is free. And then around the food, they had all these high tables and like sofa chairs. And people walk around with laptop. Very casual environment. But I can tell that a lot of work was getting done because you know people were very casual, right? When you're very casual and you're content, you know you're going to get work done, right? So I definitely think change, changing the environment is definitely very uh, helpful and valuable. So these are the four things that Jurgen talks about as far as being very critical during transformation. And again, you know, when I go into client site, I gotta use these principles, and it definitely helps. Okay, so what did I do with these embedded firmware companies, right? So as I told you, I, I do go in, I, I do an assessment. So you know, there's a little bit of management consulting, you know, as part of this deal that I do with the clients. It's not just pure coaching. Like I'll I'll look into that. You know, so I go in, and one of the first things they want you to do is, they said, okay, do an assessment for us. Tell us where we are, what the issues are, how can we go from where we are today to this agile you know, um, journey or transformation, and what is our outcome gonna look like, right? So I do the assessment, and I have my own tool set for doing the assessment. It's usually a combination of interviewing people, uh, people on the software engineers, people that support testing, people that support release management, uh, directors, uh, project managers, executives. So I usually do a week of interviewing, this Q&A kind of thing. Then I do another week of just observing some of the interactions and you know how they break down their requirements or do their planning, that kind of thing. And then the third week, I usually do my write-up and presentation to executive management about the assessment and my findings. And then the recommendations about, OK, if you want to go agile, these are your options based on my own experience and evaluation. So with that said, uh, every embedded firmware company I've worked with, you know, Scale Agile uh, framework seems to be a good fit. Now, it's not an, an, an exact fit. There is customization, which I'm going to get into. Uh, but it seems to be a better starting point than doing something that's pure Scrum or scaling Kanban by itself or some other hybrid Agile model. Um, so with that said, how many of you are familiar with SAFE? Okay, so quite a few, so that's good. <laughs> and then, uh, so the next few slides, I wanna talk about how we customize SAFE to make it work. So one of the reasons why I chose this is because, as you know, when you're building a router or you're you know, building a chip, there's a lot of people in that are going to be involved in that process, right? So that's what I kind of call the value stream, right? What is the value stream from concept to cash, right? All the people that not just support the actual firmware and embedded development, but also the hardware folks, uh, the testing folks, uh, you know, 
all the uh, supporting groups and, and all of that, right? So that's the value stream. And with that value stream, you need to have transparency, right? Because one of the issues that I've seen, like going to these client sites, is that there's a lot of silos, right? You know, people don't know exactly what the other group is working on, so there's a lot of delays because of that, right? Dependency issues arise and are never addressed because there's a lack of transparency. And then, of course, we want to make sure we have alignment as well, uh, because we want everyone to be aligned to the vision of what we're doing, right? And then, of course, program execution and code quality. So these are the values of SAFE, and this is one of the reasons why you know, I do think SAFE as a starting point works well in these environments. So you know, just like a waterfall uh, you know, uh, process, you know, you're still going to have a vision. So we all agree that you need to have a vision, right? And that's one of the things when I'm coaching clients is that I, I do make sure that we have a vision. And we do a roadmap. Right? Have any of you done a roadmap with Agile before? Where, you know, they want to know what you can deliver in like a year from now? Do you guys think it's possible to do a roadmap with Agile? We have certain goals over there, not exactly the roadmap, but the goals of the quarterly goals, and then we have these kind of things. So, to give you some insight, you know, when we were building a product, right? You know, we at a high level, you, know, you may know the high level features, right, for that product, very high level. In, in, in Scrum, if I call that epics, right? You probably know the epics. And we can size those epics as well, right? I mean, of course, they, they, they cannot be consumed in a sprint, but you can still get rough estimates. And we'll talk about estimation a little bit later. And then, based on priority, you can kind of see where they would fall, right, based on priority. And, and the estimate, right? And this is going to be done probably by technical leadership, is what I call it, right? Because you don't want to disturb the, the actual Scrum teams, right? Or Agile teams because they're focusing on execution of the current backlog, right? Uh, so you get these high level estimates from technical leadership. It could be in points, that's fine. And based on that, you can look at the team's velocity and, or the program's velocity, and then you can kind of see where they would fall. And the difference here with the roadmap is that we're not saying that we're going to go give this roadmap to executive management and say, okay, this is a roadmap and this is where we're going to deliver everything. What we're saying is, based on today, based on what we know today, this is our roadmap. Now, you're welcome to come and add more features to it, take out features. We're always going to re-estimate as well when the team gets into it, right? And therefore, you're going to get an updated roadmap you know, every so often, right? It could be at every, say, what they call PI planning. At the end of PI planning, we get a bit roadmap, or maybe you might get it after every sprint or every other sprint, right? So that's the difference between a traditional roadmap and what I would call an agile roadmap, is that we are open and we agree that this roadmap can change, right, based on the empirical information that we have. <laughs> The service phase. So I'm not sure if I would use a roadmap for for what you're describing, if I understand your your, your comment and question correctly. I mean, you're basically you're saying that, okay, you're putting people on a project or a client, and you kind of want to be able to manage or have visibility to, to when they're going to finish, so you move them into maybe a different project, that kind of thing. I wouldn't look into a roadmap for this solution. I would probably look at some other type of tool, like maybe a resource planning tool or something. And I'm sure and there are ones out there for, for this kind of uh, purpose. But even in so even in this kind of formulation, there are projects which are kind of we have kind of understanding with the client that the project is for one year. But yeah. right now we are it may be a, a more of a arrangement that for the next three three months we are going to sign up. But we do have some kind of roadmap, some kind of understanding what we are going to do. For the client. Oh yeah, yeah. In, in subsequent releases. So that's a kind yeah. of roadmap yeah, yeah, that yeah. still be possible. Yeah. yeah. But, so but in that case in this case the roadmap will be shared by the client. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It will be jointly created. 
I mean, client obviously will have their priorities yeah. and we can help them in figuring out what is realistic, what can be done exactly. and what cannot be done. So it could be co-created. Like, it would be a, a collaboration, right? And the client might be privatizing and coming up with the features of the work uh, items. And the team or your, the technical leadership is coming from the, uh, the, the service provider side. They would be providing the technical input to the effort involved. And then you'll be using you know, both of those inputs to figure out the roadmap, right? But in that yeah. case also, since uh, for long, longer engagements, is typically a multi-window scenario. So the product roadmap still is a very different roadmap which is with the parent company. Mm -hmm. And what translates <coughs> down to individual vendors are something which is very near to a team's objective or a team player objective or team roadmap. Because yeah, you so may have DCS, Accenture, HCL having their own uh, teams for a uh, release train. So I'll get into all of that with the objectives and how it rolls back up to your roadmap and how you adjust based on that. It's coming up. Yeah. One question. Uh, let's say I am making a complex uh, uh, embedded program, for example, like the setup. Yeah. I got a different uh, product roadmap for the conditional access, the module which is authorizing you digital PIL or conditional yeah. access. Yeah. Okay. These days they were located in different places and they have their own product uh, roadmap, very technical or very detailed. Sure. I put a second, um, uh, a second, uh, as a uh, slightly an application there, which is actually talking about the functionality to the end user. Let's say how the UI will look at slow pixel level or whatever, the, how the resource will look. Not UI, but concept yeah. wise, how it will flow, how it will flow, how it will batch or other. So I've got a team which is working over here. Now, what we have discovered is that there are, let's say, three or four teams which are working on this embedded product, and they have their own roadmap. In safe or in such cases, what what is that they sometimes we find that there are conflicts in between these running product programs. <laughs> so how do we handle this? <laughs> so yeah, it's coming up. Um, and if it's still not answered for some reason, then we'll talk about it towards the end. Yeah. Okay. So you're probably familiar that there are some program roles. So these are the ones that are typical but safe, and I'll tell you the ones that I added. Uh, but yeah, you have an RTE, which we all know is like a Uber Scrum Master, right? Or a Chief Scrum Master. It you know, runs the Scrum with Scrums, facilitates all the program level meetings. Um, so that's like your you know, PI planning. Um, they may meet once a week with management as well to give an update to how the progress is going for the program, right? And so on. Uh, product management, right? Uh, they own the vision, they own the program backlog. The program backlog we know has the features, right? Product backlog, or what Safe calls the team backlog, is the one that has the stories for execution and sprints, right? Uh, you have a system architect at the program level, right? Because, um, and I am a, a, a believer of this philosophy, I, I think you need to have some governance on the architecture. I don't think, I mean, so, so there's three types of architecture, right? Three terms. There is intentional architecture, emergent architecture, and architectural runway, right? Emergent architecture is going to come from the teams, which I fully agree, right? Uh, but the intentional architecture, which is a governance, I think needs to come from a system architect, which probably derives it from an enterprise architect, right? Because I think if you let teams just run wild, you're going to get people with different architectural solutions, and you're going to probably create more chaos. So yeah, so I am a big believer of intentional, emergent, and architectural runway. And architectural runway is basically laying down the foundation incrementally to build the prioritized features, right? So in the large operation, this, this system architect is driving the product backlog, which is going into the team backlog. Now it is the, the, the team level, the emerging architect is basically a feedback to the system architect who is actually taking care of the team Yeah, process. so, I, yeah, so I, uh, I agree with most of what you're saying. So I do agree that the system architect is helping to drive the program backlog in partnership with the product manager, right? So they'll help with the architectural technical features and the product manager with the business features. And then based on priority, the, uh, the architectural features, for example, the team will take that, break them down into the stories, which is based on their origin design. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sure. Product manager and business owners. Okay. They are related. Product business owners, is it the market facing teams? 
usually business owners, uh, and they, you know, from what I understand from being left well, um, you're right, it's typically marketing folks. So they're kind of driving, so in say, uh, you have epics, features, and you have stories. And I know that's a little bit confusing if you're coming from pure scrum, but that's the hierarchy. So the epics are driven by the business owner. So business owner typically market Yeah, those are more market based. Second is, why is this technology program backlog is uh, so conspicuous here? Like, it can be proactive actually. The features that we intend developing is not necessarily a backlog. The backlog is something which you have not done and you want to do. Yeah, so I'll get into that because the reason they have the concept of program backlog is because we're assuming that you're going to have multiple teams working off of that program backlog. So they'll be pulling stuff from the program backlog their team backlog to create stories and then it, it means it's like giving a message that uh, we have faltered somewhere earlier. It's a, I'm not sure, I'm just trying to criticize the safe it's a Sure, sure. No, I mean, that's I mean, fine. Backlog is a general term. I mean, it's yeah, the first time that I heard, it's like, it's it gave me an impression of... It's in past we have failed actually. It's a negative connotation that's giving it. Yeah. And you know, like I'll say this. Um, you know, if you're in a position of implementing, you know, a framework or an, an agile, uh, you know, framework, and you decide to go with say, like I would say, you know, change the terminology. You don't have to use this terminology to be honest. Uh, whatever the client and you are comfortable with, just go with that. And that's why I consider it a framework because you can customize it. And even if you talk to Dean, he'll say call it whatever you want to call it, whatever makes sense. So yeah, so if, if you and the client think that this is you know, bad connotation because of some internal reasons, you know. It's um, negative or positive. Yeah. The morning was sort of talking about that. Yeah. yeah. You know, just change terminology. I mean, like, I think, yeah, I mean, that's what I would do. I would just change it. Okay. System team uh, is mainly responsible for integration testing, right? So you've got, let's say, you got eight teams, you know, executing stories in their sprints. You know, pumping out code, testing their own code, right, within the sprint. But then all that code needs to come together and get tested, right? So that's the system team's main function, uh, main responsibility. And then business owners, we, we kind of touched on, you know, they are more market facing and safe. They're driving the epics, right? And that's what they're doing. And they're definitely key stakeholders on the agile train. So, would you be touching on system team later on? Or? I am. I'm actually introducing a different team as well. <laughs> I had something we can even discuss later on. Also. Yeah. I suppose you will call it time back to seven minutes time or eight minutes time. So what's the time now? You have called seven or eight minutes. Oh. There are no timekeepers here? No, we are here. Okay, yeah. so how much time? 45. Five minutes left? Five to ten. Ten minutes. Oh, really? Yeah, so you will call back. Okay, so then uh, hold your questions. <laughs> I got quite a few slides ago. Okay. Um, so what I did here was, uh, we, we talked earlier about how you need time to break down the feature into uh, design, right? Uh, you need to do some analysis. So I actually introduced a systems engineering team at the program level, right? And believe it or not, some of these clients have actually had full-time systems engineers that were actually doing this full-time. So it wasn't like this huge stella I had to do. All I had to do was basically show them a structure to how they could operate an agile model that would work. So we created, so yeah, so, so we had a systems engineering team. They would pull features based on priority from program backlog, knowing that this is coming up in the next program increment, which is like three months later, right? So they had the lead time of three months to do the analysis of those features and create whatever uh, design uh, content they had to, to create to help the product owner and the team create stories. Right? So that was a team we introduced at the uh, program level. Excuse and me, you said the system engineering team already existed. No, that, that was the systems team. No, you just said that the engineers you put together and formed the team, right? Oh, so yeah, yeah. So they so were already there. Before you defined this role, what were they doing? What you said is what system engineers are doing. So what is it that Yeah, so, so, so the issue was, in the waterfall paradigm, they were working in the silo. They didn't have the coordination transparency to what they should be focusing on, right? Which I'm going to get into. 
So yeah. Okay, so they ran in uh, Kanban, right? Uh, for those of you that are familiar with Kanban, uh, it's, it's a pull system. Uh, you, you can pull work in based on priority, right? And you work on it. So we created a Kanban board and they were part of our PI planning so they knew what features were coming up. They also were part of the pre-planning as well. So they would meet with product management and the system architect and understand what are the next set of features coming out of the pipe. Then they would organize that on the Kanban board and they would pull it in, create the design content, and then publish it. And then there might be some review that goes on and then they'll be ready uh, well before the next PI planning. So that way the team can pull that information in doing the backlog grooming and create stories. Okay. So we use the static approach to design a Kanban system. Uh, real quick, static is systems thinking approach to choosing Kanban. It's a very pragmatic approach where you design your own Kanban system by looking at the workflow, the big picture, and designing a Kanban board based on that. If you have questions, I'll take it offline. Um, and the reason this worked well is because our lead time was 8 to 12 weeks. Why was it 8 to 12 weeks? Because a PI increment is 2 to 3 months, right? So while the team was executing the current PI, they had 8 to 12 weeks based on their cadence to do the analysis for the next set of features for the next PI. So we talked about program backlog. It basically contained uh, features. Uh, you had business features and you had architectural features. And it was prioritized in collaboration or in partnership between product manager and the system architect. And features were added into stories, which went into the team backlog and the team executed, right? Uh, the, the ratio we had was we had one product owner, I mean product manager to two to four product owners, and each product owner to one to two teams. Um, and they organized their work, right? We all know that in Scrum. Uh, we know that. Uh, estimation. So what we did for estimation was we had to do something that helped us normalize the, the effort, right? Uh, so for those of you that are familiar with SAFE, we did use the SAFE approach for estimation. Uh, so we said that, okay, we'll benchmark a story at one point one day, and then we compared the other stories from the backlog to that benchmark. Is it you know, 1x, 2x, you know, 3x, 5x effort, right? benchmark story, and that's how we did our estimation. And that kind of helped us to semi-normalize our <coughs> points. And of course, you know, if it was a brand new team, we gave them, you know, uh, eight points for a two-week sprint per person to help calculate the velocity, and then we subtracted points for our time off, right? And this is all uh, from SAFE. It's not something that I made up. It's something that we just went with after discussing with the team uh, as far as how we want to do the estimation. And of course, we use the modified Fibonacci sequence, which is what you see there. Uh, you know, basically, after 13, it goes 20, 40, 100. Uh, and, we, and I definitely did strive to estimate as a whole. Regardless if people were not doing the physical work for that story, I still wanted them to be involved uh, because it helps to share the information, right? That's why we, we actually do the, the uh, team estimation together. So uh, now let's get to the PI. Um, so we did, uh, you know, use the PI agenda, um, and this worked out really well. And this is one of the biggest feedback I get from Cisco, Juniper, and these other companies is that they really appreciate the PI planning. Two days, everybody gets together. We're working off of the same common uh, program backlog. We're there with all the support people we need, to get questions answered, and all of that. We have hardware representatives uh, here. We have people uh, from the systems engineering there to answer questions. Uh, we also have uh, people from the different testing groups to help to test the program level there. So we've got all these people there, plus the actual Scrum teams and all the uh, management as well, right? So we go down to this uh, two-day uh, agenda where the output of this two-day is each team has a plan, a draft plan for the next uh, two to three months of what they're going to work on roughly in, in their sprints, okay? And we also have a dependency uh, board. I, I think we heard that yesterday with the talk about risk management. We had something similar where we did have risks that were identified on the board. A lot of them were dependencies. So we have that as an output as well. And then, of course, we all you know, do confidence voting at the end, making sure that we're all confident. So we can build it. Say the same. Did you use anything uh, for the firm with the template company yeah, so they were, yeah, so we had representatives.
representatives from hardware, right, that were there. Because, and I'm going to get into that at the very end, because I'm going to get into emulation, simulation testing, and how that plays a role. I'm just trying to get to the slide. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so this is uh, some pictures I took. You probably can't see it very well. Uh, so this person was our, um, I gotta say that, so this person was, was our RTE, uh, and he was giving over, and he was going over the agenda for what we're doing for the two-day planning. Uh, this is our uh, senior VP of engineering. Uh, on suit, he was giving up, uh, giving the overall vision to why we're here and what we're doing. Uh, this, is, this was our product uh, uh, manager going over the features. Uh, this was our system architect going over the architecture. Um, and then we were going over the planning, the draft plan, and what we're trying to accomplish there. Uh, and this, this is the breakout sessions where you see the teams discussing uh, and trying to come up with a draft plan. And we have product owners and other people answering questions. Same thing going on here, with the system architect interacting with the team. Um, this is another uh, team as well. And then we're doing our draft plan presentation here. So after each team created a draft plan, then we present it at the end. Okay, so what about testing, right? So I talked early on about how how we uh, you know can't just do testing on hardware uh, directly, right? So what we did was we had the conversation with hardware and we said, okay, we have a couple options here, right? We can either do emulation testing, right? Which does require setup and con configurations and all of that. And we are going to need a, a group to support the setup of that. So that could be the system team, possibly, or it, it, it could be a, a subgroup within the system team, right? Um, so we had that conversation. The other option was, can we get proto hardware? Is that possible, right? So if proto hardware was possible, proto hardware is only possible if the hardware team knows what your roadmap is, attentively, uh, knows what your prioritized features are so that they can create proto hardware in time for your testing, right? So another reason why they had to be there for PI planning, another reason why they had to be a part of the overall conversation and need to understand the alignment and the cadence, right? And the last option was, if you had the hardware ready to go, then you can just test on the hardware, right? Potentially, you could, right? So those were your three options. Most of the cases, it ended up being emulation testing, in some cases, prototype, and very rarely do we have the hardware already ready. Um, the other thing I want to mention is we did like, we do continuous integration. Okay, we don't do continuous deployment, but we did do CI. Okay, so you can still accomplish CI in the embedded firmware space, um, but you are going to need you know someone to champion that. So another thing that we did here is that we did set up a community of practice. And we had some people who drove the CI uh, part of it and came up with some best practices or good practices that that worked. And then, of course, uh, you know, we are able to do system demos, right? So system demos at the end of every sprint and also the program demo at the end of every PI. Again, it was either on emulations or it was on proto hardware or we had the hardware. So here's what I'll say. Uh, so this gets into the release management part of it, right? So I, I didn't cover release management at all. Uh, and as far as demos are concerned, uh, I would say that it would be up to the, the discretion of the product manager and the business owners if they wanted to invite customers to come and see it. In some cases, they, they do, right? And in some cases, they don't because they want to get further progress. At the end of the day, the business owners and the product manager are accepting the system demo and the PI demo, right? Um, so they were basically our direct customers, which those people, because they were the stakeholders that were accepting. So the internal teams are there in the demo mostly. They, they, they are sub mandated to attend this demo, or that also is not. Let's say I am doing a, a, a small team, a scrum team is going to have the demo and it will be test fine. At a PI level, what is the intended audience as for you? So, so that's a good question. So this is what we've done differently as well, and I didn't mention this before. Um, so we actually didn't do a team, a formal team demo, right? Even though 
saved us safe to do a formal team demo. And this is the reason why. I, I had the conversation and I said, okay, you guys are going to be doing a system demo, okay, and a PI demo. You guys are going to be getting stories. So they all, like, they all agree as part of their team agreement they want to get stories accepted in real time. So as a team finished the story, they wanted to show it to the product owner in real time and get it accepted or get feedback and fix it, right? So they said, okay, we're going to get stories accepted in real time. We're going to do the system demo and PI demo at the program level. Do you guys still want to do a team demo because, you know, what's the justification for it, right? And what we came up with was this. We said, well, you know what? Let's all of us get together based on, on geographic location, right? So we did have distributed teams, right? So all the people that were in San Jose, even though they belonged to different teams, would get together on the last day of the sprint for like the last hour or two hours of the day. And they would turn it into a social hour. And you know we had budget to buy some beer and chips and snacks. And the engineers would just demo to the other engineers what, what they did in that sprint, just to share some information about like, what was useful for them. And that proved to be very, very valuable, actually. And, and the teams were a lot more motivated for that kind of arrangement than doing a, a formal demo to the product owner, knowing that the product owner has already seen all these stories, right? So with that said, so that's what we did. And then we still did the formal system demo, which was a few days after the sprint ended, which was done by the system team. Yeah. The system team says actually over here, the system engineering team you're talking about, the one who's actually So let me clarify on this one. It's very common in the embedded and open source space that you're going to have multiple testing teams, right? Yeah. You're going to have multiple testing teams. Yeah. And they're all, okay, just give me one, one more minute. So they're, they're all going to be involved with testing. Out of those multiple testing teams, you've got to pick one team that's will, they're willing to take on the role of the system team as the by the same, which is responsible for giving the demos and that kind of thing. Okay. I, I can take questions offline. I apologize. Okay. Thank, thanks. Thanks.